Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development, where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Please subscribe, leave a review, comment, share, and consider supporting the podcast on Patreon, even at the producer and sponsorship levels. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I share my recent panel discussion from the Western Academy of Management conference titled, What Have We Learned? COVID-Inspired Approaches to Teaching and Learning. So I'll just give a little bit of an introduction. Uh, I don't know that changes related to COVID need an introduction, but (laughs) it's kind of unprecedented that higher education changed so quickly um, because typically we're very traditional and we don't change. Change is very slow. Uh, So We're reflecting on the rapid accelerated changes that have occurred during the last two years and how that has required retooling on the part of institutions and faculty and students and particularly related to delivery modalities and pedagogical approaches and technology and then what are the longer term impacts of that and how might these changes actually be beneficial to students both now and in the future and particularly in the workplace, which has also changed significantly um, in terms of uh, how people conduct work and communicate with each other and where they work. So we have prepared a few questions and we will respond to each question and we will, I'm sure, have plenty of time for interaction discussion as well. So the first question is, what new practices, pedagogical innovations, or delivery methods have you developed over the past two years to engage students in a virtual environment and facilitate learning? So we'll just start with Yang. More interested in their like uh, research on how uh, my hospitality management students perceive before pandemic and during a pandemic, and then uh, right now we are in the like a transition, moving from the during a pandemic to the post uh, pandemic situation. So I see that I used traditionally I used to teach like a face to face a live course, as you know and then transition from the face-to-face to online that give us a lot of way of the how we're going to uh, op- give a, like an open learning or educational resources on through the online. And then I see that uh, comparing the post uh, pre-pandemic and then during a pandemic situation, we see that there are a lot of demanding from the from the students that like I see that more than five to ten percent of requests coming from the coming from the student because the uh, as I said I'm teaching uh, hospitality management student they are working at like a full time like a three shift on in the morning day daytime and then in even evening night shift so they are asking more extension of the due date and then open up the more uh, learning resources uh, during a pandemic situation because they see that they can be f- uh, physically located in different uh, area. Like I have, right now I have one student in, based in Hawaii and then wants to give like a more tutorial session. And then I have one student in London. 
So, and then the one in, in Africa. So we try to adjust the timing issue first to see that how we're going to accommodate in a better way. And, and then, so that's the way that how we can see that uh, the learning and then teaching environment had been changed a lot due to the pandemic. And then their working hour had been changed in then of their uh, situation. And right now also I have one student uh, physically located in Utah, but their immediate family located in Ukraine right now. So they have a tension. So they ask a lot of extension and then uh, excuse from their, uh, how they're going to meet the deadline, something like that. There is one challenge that I can see that there is a difference between the uh, pre-pandemic and during a pandemic and transition moving through to the post-pandemic right now. Flexibility has really been the name of the game over the last couple of years. Um, and certainly flexibility in terms of the health, the physical and mental health of students um, as they're navigating everything. And then flexibility in terms of, of timing, whether synchronous or asynchronous approaches to our course design. Uh, and then obviously locational flexibility. And, and so overnight, most uh, institutions had to go virtual. Uh, many of them did live streaming. Uh, some of them had, you know, some courses were asynchronous. Um, so with all that context, um, the course I wanted to focus in on in my commentary today is my organizational development and change management class. Now, I've been teaching this course uh, in a, a wide range of modalities for the last, I don't know, 12 plus years. So I've taught traditional face-to-face, uh, on, you know, asynchronous online. I've taught it uh, in hybrid uh, various hybrid formats. Um, and, but in all of those different ways that I taught it previously, uh, I'd never taught it the same way that I ended up teaching it the last couple of years during the pandemic. Um, the other component to this class, so not only is it a, it's a change management course and we're, we're going through theories and we're doing practical application and case studies, but it's also a service learning course. And so the students always do a hands-on experiential learning a live case consulting project with an area organization. Uh, and that's always been a hallmark of my class. Um, now doing that in a face-to-face or a hybrid environment is one thing. Um, even doing it in kind of a more traditional online environment is another thing. Over the last two years, uh, I've had to wrestle with how am I going to go about doing, you know, a live case experiential learning consulting class with students who in many cases are scattered, um, you have time zone issues, uh, all of that stuff that Yang was just talking about, but also you have the issue with community partners and the organizations you're trying to work with, uh, where previously the students could go in person and they could meet on site and they could meet with people and do interviews and collect data and do whatever they're doing for their, their OD change intervention project. And now they have to do everything virtually as a team They can't meet together individually as a team, and they have to do everything with the client virtually as well. Uh, So that's been the wrestle, that's been the challenge, and that's what um, I'll be sharing more about as we go through it with the panel today. So I've been, excuse me, I've been in this department for only a year. I was in the accounting department teaching business law at the time when COVID hit, Um, and we were basically closed down. Uh, And I was teaching face-to-face business law classes. Part of our engaged learning um, with these courses, all of our, all of the teachers there ask for, um, you know, experiential um, information and engaged learning in going to court. That was totally closed down. So we had, a, I had a big problem with that. I had some of my students who were very, you know, it was March when it happened, very eager beavers and they did it early, but most of them did not. So I had to resort to um, finding some, um, a, basically it was a pretty famous murder case in Utah where a um, doctor had killed his wife. But of course, they didn't know that because they had to watch the YouTube. Anyway, having to trade that and change that up completely and um, design it completely different along with, um, because this class, my face-to-face class, 
I have, I do an uh, online business law, but it's a different course. It's a different publisher. It's everything. So I had that one and it was okay, but this one was different and getting all of the new assignments that I had to have them do and doing, um, uh, a synchronous so we I had to teach classes at the same time you know every Tuesday and Thursday or Monday Wednesday Friday whatever it was and getting that was the, for me that was really very I was very nervous because I didn't know and we have um, Microsoft so I had to learn teams like in a day um, and teaching this uh, synchronous class um, at one o'clock in the afternoon on Tuesday, Thursdays, and making sure that my students were going to be there. So for me, that was a huge thing. Over the weekend, I was afraid I wasn't even going to be able to show up because I didn't know if I knew how to do it that well. Um, thank goodness. It all worked out. It's great now. I love it. I'll just add a couple more points. So at our university, uh, we were very much encouraged to be flexible as John mentioned. And even before COVID, our president identified some core values or themes. And one of these was exceptional care. So as Jill was talking, I was thinking about that exceptional care in terms of accommodating students and adjusting assignments and everyone was kind of in the same boat, learning technology together and new systems and uh, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, Jill also mentioned Microsoft Teams, which we had in place, but we hadn't used much. And we certainly hadn't used it to deliver uh, synchronous courses. Uh, but in my case, similar to John, I had been teaching uh, my course with a variety of modalities, hybrid face-to-face -face and completely online. But what I've found kind of in the last several months in particular is that Microsoft Teams is really valuable for helping students do virtual teamwork. They can do their chat, they can have meetings, they can share documents. And I can uh, observe what they're doing and what they're talking about. <laughs> So prior to that, in the online courses, they were using whatever Google Docs or, you know, whatever they their own chat on their phone or, you know, they had all different ways of communicating and working in their teams. And now I've really encouraged them to use Microsoft Teams. And I think it's it's helpful because fewer students get lost and I can do a little more tracking and looking at um, how they're doing and what issues they might be having. So our second question is, um, how have students responded to these efforts and which of these practices will you keep or modify and what do you anticipate you'll abandon? So there's always a lot of discussion, uh, you know, are these permanent changes? Uh, what, have, what have we learned and what will we move forward and uh, continue to support? So we will get some perspectives on that from our panelists. I'm teaching two uh, courses, which is extremely uh, different uh, course modules. Like uh, one is the uh, step course and the other one is the global tourism. So as the title says that one is a little bit difficult to uh, follow through and then the other one, which is the global tourism, it's more uh, self-study. I don't need to give more uh, detailed information about uh, the, like in terms of lecturing and then assignment, something like that. But the stat class I'm teaching, um, by changing from their face-to-face, -face, the online course, I ask them to like, uh, uh, you need to spend more time uh, than used to be in terms of a preparation of the uh, uh, courses. So I switch uh, the course module a little bit in terms of the uh, how let them uh, prepare the course before they move into actual uh, content of the course. So I change the one module of the, uh, that course, like uh, uh, ask them to take a quiz first. Then they can, I can give like a little bit push to them to reading a material before uh, move into the actual content of the 
uh, the chapter by taking a quiz so they can, uh, they have to study anyway. So uh, that's the one that I give them. And also uh, one thing that I implement into the, uh, uh, my course is that I encourage them to be in the team-based learning. We call the TBL. So which you focus on their, like uh, my, my students working in their hotel industry and the restaurant industry, more service-related industries, so they work as a team all the time. So um, I ask them to uh, learn learning the course by having a team. So I put that in into how they can learn uh, the course material from the team-based learning, which means the peer-to-peer evaluation and then peer-to-peer -peer observation and how they're going to engage into more in-depth about their as a team. So I ask them to, why don't you submit their old assignment as a team base? And then one submission for the team and then try to, at the end of the semester, I will ask about the peer observation, peer evaluation to see that which, who is the leading person in the group, even though I assigned the, the the team leader in that group. So I want to uh, motivate them there, having like a, having a team-based learning uh, that kind of a concept into that. So I see that there are a lot of increase of their, their learning, especially for the step class uh, by uh, sharing that some kind of a, uh, uh, solutions and then uh, tips about how they can uh, solve the, some kind of a case study, something like that. So I see that there is an improvement of learning by asking them to do the team-based learning from the peers. And if they don't come up with a, a great solution, and then they, I ask them to uh, ask me, and then I act like a tutor for, their, for their, each team. If they have some kind of conflict issue about the learning concept, something like that. So I like the team-based learning. Uh, especially in the this kind of the uh, 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 during a pandemic situation, there are definitely things that I plan to adjust going forward, and other things that I've discovered over the last couple of years that have really, really worked well uh, that I think I'll continue to do. So I'm going to try to just outline a few of them, and I'm happy to talk, you know, more <laughs> with any of you if you have questions about uh, that in more detail. Um, with, with my organizational development and change management class, like I was saying previously, one of the biggest new challenges was not necessarily the modality or the live streaming or, or things like that, but it was the connection with community partners doing service learning, experiential learning when everything has to be done virtually. Um, and, and so one of the things that I chose to do right away uh, was simplify my approach uh, previously, what I had done is essentially the semester leading up, you know, to the next semester, I would be vetting community partner organizations, client organizations, uh, through my own personal network. Sometimes I'd use re resources at the university. I would start to line up organizations and I start to line up projects for my students. And I would usually, you know, I would have a class of maybe 35 students. So I would want, you know, around six or seven projects that they could do. So I would reach out and try to arrange projects with six or seven different organizations. And each project would be unique each with each organization. They'd all have similar parameters, similar kind of scaffolding around what the projects needed to look like. Uh, but ultimately they were each unique projects. And then the students would self-select into teams based on which organization they wanted to be a part of and what the specific project was going to be for that organization. I would invite representatives of the organization to come into class um, either in person or join us through Teams or, or some sort of uh, video conferencing. The first week of class, the students would then uh, decide which ones they wanted to be a part of, and they, they would self-select into Teams. And for the most part, I'd have them rank order, like which projects they wanted to be on, but pretty much students usually got to work on the, the projects they wanted to with the people they wanted to. Uh, and then they would go through a series of processes in terms of doing a needs analysis and a proposal with the organization, all of that, um, which I won't go into all that detail right now, but they would go through all of that. And it's a fairly complex process for me as the instructor to lay all of that out for them to try to set it up clearly and set it up well so they can have a good experience in this consulting engagement with the organization. And during the pandemic, one of the very first things I saw was the number of organizations who wanted to do projects went down dramatically 
because they were all wrestling with how to, how are they going to pivot? How are they going to keep their doors open? Um, and they weren't sure, like they were trying to deal with all of that simultaneously. Uh, and so I decided to simplify and go with one organization and have um, different teams work on different pieces of a much bigger project. Uh, and collectively, you know, each of their little segments, it was like a Voltron or like a, you know, whatever, where all, all their little pieces then go together to create this big, huge project. Um, and it kind of worked well. But what I also decided was I was just going to, because uh, now everyone's virtual, they're just meeting completely virtually. I decided I'm just going to assign people into teams because they're never seeing each other in person. All their team meetings are completely virtual. They've never had connection with these these other students. Um, and so I, I'm just going to assign them to projects. It's all the same organization. I'm going to just assign them to teams. Um, and for many reasons, and some of which I'm sure come immediately to your head as I see some people nodding, um, that hasn't always worked out so well. Um, there's been more team conflict um, over the last couple of years than I've ever had in running this course with these types of projects in all the years previously. Um, so one of the things I want to get back to is just having more unique projects with more organizations, allowing students to self-select again, like I used to, um, because I think that has led to more buy-in of the students into the projects, more meaningful experiences, and they just get, seem to get more out of it. So that's one thing I definitely plan to, to shift as we move forward. So I have to be um, honest here because I... Um, moved from uh, another department in the middle of this. So I was teaching all business law classes at the time the pandemic hit. And then I moved just a year ago into this department. So I am still trying to gain a lot of uh, <laughs> some kind of track um, of what I'm doing, basically. So I kind of have my business law stuff down, but um, I've learned that, uh, that I was doing a Teams thing. Actually, Marina and I were doing a Teams uh, project during all of this and uh, to get some information from different types of, and you were doing organizational behavior and I was doing business law and then we had another teacher talking about teams anyway for that time period I decided to abandon the part where my teams were very small and so I made my teams bigger my teams were only for people and because it was the pandemic and this was my business law teams they were some of them never showed up to class and never did the work and never did what they said they were going to do. And there was a lot of conflict there because people felt like that they were doing all the work, which they were. <laughs> and I just had to say, Hey, um, just kind of work with them and do what you can with what you've got. And actually, I think I got a lot of good feedback actually from the provost that said that I was very understanding and very flexible and I got an award from it. And I think it was from those actual, <laughs> because I was flexible and trying to work with them and understanding what they were going through. Hey, they're not doing this part and they're supposed to do it and they're not doing it. So I'm abandoned four member teams. That's not big enough for me. And also I've, um, I've started a whole new curriculum too. So I've had a lot of stuff on my plate to do now business ethics. And I've learned a lot of things there. So I've expanded my teams to be basically the whole class so that they can interact with one another. And that's kind of what I've learned with my experience. I will comment a little bit on how students responded to um, these changes and efforts. Uh, one difference that I saw is uh, during the main parts, I guess, of the pandemic when we were all online or predominantly online, we of course had a lot of students who didn't have the choice to do online or face-to-face. -face. In my class, I, in, uh, before that, you know, students could choose and they were choosing online because that was their preferred mode of learning. But in um, during COVID, they were more or less forced into it. 
Uh, so I saw a lot of students who thought, you know, we were only doing it online because of COVID. They didn't realize that the course had already existed and that had been a choice previously to take the course online. So I think there was a lot more of what Jill has referred to as the need for exceptional care to help students understand that they are capable and they can be successful online. And just, I did a lot of outreach. Um, we use Canvas as our LMS and I used the analytics and tools in the grade book to reach out to students with lower scores on specific assignments or lower grades overall and just reached out and asked how I could help, what they needed. Um, of course, there were cases where I didn't get any response back and those students ended up probably being kind of lost, but most students really appreciated that and said, you know, that it's a little bit uncommon for students to reach, uh, for faculty to reach out one-on-one -on -one like that. Um, and then my husband tuned me in and he said, why are you only reaching out to the ones who aren't doing very well? Why don't you reach out to the ones that are doing super well and tell them, you know, how impressed you are and how much you appreciate them and, you know, just kind of give them a pat on the back. So I did that too. <laughs> okay, so our next question is um, on our own learning. So our communities of learning and uh, how we work together as professors within our departments or colleges or within the university as a whole to learn from each other all of these different uh, new strategies and retooling and pedagogies that we were experiencing. And I'll just start us off by saying we have uh, an excellent Office of Teaching and Learning on our campus. So we already had a really good infrastructure in place with uh, instructional designers and technology experts and uh, software and processes and things already established. It was still, you know, a huge and rapid shift uh, to make uh, extensive modifications, but we did have a good infrastructure in place. And they were, um, the Office of Teaching and Learning was very innovative in terms of uh, sponsoring trainings and workshops and getting um, faculty to share what they were doing. And because of COVID money, we also got paid to go to most of those. <laughs> so we got uh, little stipends for those. So I will let the panelists respond. Uh, my institution, Utah Valley University, gave us a great, uh, as Maureen said, a uh, great professional development workshop. So I attended the first stage of the team-based learning workshop. Uh, but actually, I felt that like uh, it's more theory or conceptual-based uh, uh, workshop. So it's a little bit tedious at the first time. But as the uh, uh, time moved on, and then I learned on that uh, team-based learning is uh, one of the fundamental way of the how we can in, um, let my students improve their learning. And then right now I'm uh, attending another workshop, which is the second stage of the uh, team-based learning, which is based on the more practical way of the uh, how we can uh, share our experience uh, among the peers of, the, I'm, I mean, the peer means the faculty members that who've been teaching uh, team-based learning courses. So uh, I think that uh, the, our office of uh, learning uh, uh, is a great way of the, how we're going to improve the uh, uh, team-based learning uh, pedagogy in, apply, applied into their engage learning opportunity for my, my our students and also I go for extra mile for attending another workshop offered by another institution called the critics that give us the, like a peer evaluation format and then how we're going to implement their more way of the how uh, let my our students be being in their critically apply their team-based learning into their uh, case study and then project or something like that.
Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Academy. Courses, micro-credentials, and certificates to upskill and reskill for the future of work. All HCI Academy courses, micro-credentials, and certificates are designed, developed, and delivered by award-winning and internationally renowned scholars, educators, thought leaders, executives, and practitioners. Our courses, micro-credentials, and certificates will help you make your mark on the future of work and make an immediate impact in your organizations. Check out the HCI Academy and our many course offerings and certificates to upskill and reskill for the future of work. Check out our new weekly LinkedIn newsletter, Alchemizing Human Capital, exploring industry trends via original research and interviews with executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We look forward to having you join us. Yeah, I think of this question and, you know, connection to like a culture of, of learning among faculty. Um, and I think there's a variety of ways our university tries to do that and how we tried to do it in our department and in the School of Business. I thought it might be helpful to give you just a little bit of context for those of you who aren't familiar with UVU. So we're south of Salt Lake City in Utah, about 35 minutes. Um, We're the largest public institution, well, we're the largest institution in the state of Utah, uh, about 42,000 students. Uh, We're dual mission, meaning we do the the traditional um, university role in the region, but we're also serving the community college role in the region as well. So we're open enrollment. Anyone can come and join and, and do developmental courses to get up to speed to take other university courses uh, and then matriculate and move into other programs. Uh, and so we're, you know, for Utah, Utah's not super diverse, but for Utah, um, we're fairly diverse in terms of, um, you know, first gen students and, and uh, non-traditional students. Um, we have lots of those types of students and lot, most of our students are working and coming to school. We're a community campus. Uh, we're, you know, a regional teaching university. So teaching first is the focus, even though, you know, to, we, we try to do research to support our teaching. So with that as the context, um, as others have already mentioned, we have a really robust office of teaching and learning. We also have a robust office of engaged learning. Um, uh, and that's, I have another role in addition to being department chair, I oversee the, the service learning efforts across campus um, and do workshops in conjunction with the Office of Teaching and Learning uh, to train up faculty on how to, to do service learning, how to implement it effectively, and have good outcomes for students. Um, so for all of that, I would say university-wide, we have a fairly good, robust culture of learning for our faculty. Uh, faculty take pride in teaching. It, it, everyone knows when they come to UVU as a faculty member, that's the number one um, thing that we're going to be focusing on. Yes, you need to serve and do all those things. Yes, you need adequate research, but teaching is number one. Um, so I think that's well understood uh, in the department and in the School of Business. You know, we do um, cross uh, interdisciplinary um, workshops uh, that are sponsored by the School of Business. In the department, we haven't really done that. We do try to take some time uh, out of a department meeting agenda to do kind of micro lessons and micro spots on on what different faculty members are doing in, in terms of innovative teaching in their courses and to share that with other faculty in the department. And frankly, we probably should do more of that um, to provide more, even more opportunity for people to share and learn from each other uh, because we have what we're 16 full-time faculty in the department now, I think. Um, we have a lot of people across a lot of different disciplines doing a lot of really cool things. And uh, I'm a big believer in just, creating that kind of a culture of, of continuous learning and experimentation in our courses so that we can uh, continue to, to provide even better offerings for our students. I think that uh, Yang probably mentioned this, but I was um, really excited to take the, from the Office of Teaching and Learning, the Online Teaching Academy and get my certificate for online teaching which was, um, and I did that about a year ago, I guess, in the midst of the pandemic, think, uh, hoping and uh, praying that this would help my 
online classes because I pretty much um, ended up just teaching online, <clears throat> even though, what was it, last semester or fall semester, we were doing both. I didn't do that, where they were doing a face-to-face -face and a, a synchronous at the same time. Anyway, so I was doing online and so excited to take this online teaching academy and getting a lot of information, a lot of um, reading articles and um, different uh, views from different academics that this, uh, the, um, um, the uh, Office of Teaching and Learning had put together so that we could uh, be helped in learning how to teach better online. And I really appreciated that. And also I took a service learning class a couple times actually from, <laughs> from my, um, he said he was um, very much involved with service learning and he was, and John was the facilitator, facilitator for the service learning part. So I've taken those two to make my courses more robust and um, it's helped a lot. And then also received some stipends for um, also making my course prettier and um, I guess more hands-on and easier for my students but like I said I've just gotten here so I was um, in the process of getting my uh, courses or, or my course I should say the business ethics course prettier like I said and um, have it just more put into modalities and to be more user-friendly for my students, which I really appreciate too. So I've done a lot of stuff that I probably would not have done. Actually, I'm in a different place than I thought I was going to be because of COVID and some other circumstances, but very, um, very enlightening and a lot of changes for me. Several of the panelists have mentioned uh, different trainings they have taken and uh, different initiatives they've adopted. All of these, uh, or most of these, uh, have ongoing communities of learning. So for example, Yang mentioned team-based learning. Uh, so through Microsoft Teams, uh, the Office of Teaching and Learning created a team for team-based learning where all the people who have done that training can continue to ask questions, share resources, share ideas, and that kind of thing. So it's not just a one-time type of training or development activity, but you continue to be connected with faculty across the university and learn and find out what they're doing. So that has also been valuable. Our next question is uh, focused on technology. So innovations that have helped students develop skills that will be valuable in the future. So we're looking to through all of this time with COVID and the changes that have been made and technology and different types of learning, how can we use that to help students uh, prepare better for their careers and what they will encounter in the workplace? Um, our institution, uh, we use the Canvas and through the uh, Microsoft, Microsoft Teams. So um, I think it takes time for, for the students to learn how they're going to technically improve their skill on the, utilizing their uh, Microsoft Teams. So I'm more engaged in to uh, upload the, uh, the course lecture through the Microsoft Teams so we can uh, share their, uh, my lecture and then they, I ask, invite them to uh, see the lecture that I posted in. And also I that's for the like a regular lecture and then also I uh, give a tutorial session for my stat class because uh, they have some kind of a uh, conflict issue in terms of understanding the, uh, some concept of the, each chapter so uh, I increase them to uh, more dig into more engaging into Microsoft Teams um, technological skill that they can improve so the more they can engage in the Microsoft team technical skill, the better they can use it uh, for the classroom and then for their, uh, their, their job situation too. And also I see the technology issue 
in terms of the, how they're going to apply the uh, utilizing the Excel that most people, most students having know that how they can use Excel, but I uh, ask them to advance their skill, utilizing the Excel skill to adopt into the uh, like, uh, like a research on like a small case study, something like that, that how they're going to implement that, the numbers, then come up with the good outcome in terms of the like a uh, uh, in our hotel industry, we focus on the revenue management, how we're going to maximize the revenue by looking at the uh, yield management concept, like uh, looking at the uh, uh, like, uh, demand and supply issue. So I teach them how they can be more, more better off the, learning the advanced skill in the Excel, or sometimes I ask them to uh, much better advance the, uh, the step uh, skill like uh, uh, SPSS, so they can easily adopt the skill uh, when they move into the uh, uh, their job level. So they can um, use that that kind of skill while they are working in the industry. So I'm more technically not a technical person, but I emphasize that high tech, high touch concept, so that uh, how they're gonna improve, improve, and then uh, implement their learning skill when they actually work in the industry. For this question, I thought I'd focus a bit on the future of work aspect. Um, I think uh, Yang mentioned the technology pretty well. Um, the pandemic accelerated us into the shift, right? Uh, there was already a movement towards online learning. Our university had made pushes towards that. Um, it's not like online learning was new, uh, synchronous or asynchronous, um, but the massive widespread adoption of it was new and people being uncomfortable with the technologies and then learning kind of being forced to learn how to embrace the technologies and how to utilize them effectively that was new and and now people who thought they never wanted to teach online um i don't know how it is that you're in university but many of those very same people that kind of went kicking and screaming towards teaching online during the pandemic now that they kind of figured out how to do it and they realized the strengths of it and how to do it effectively now they kind of don't want to go back. <laughs> they want to, you know, continue to have that flexibility both for themselves, but also for their students. Um, so that's an ongoing dynamic. That's going to be interesting to see how it plays out at our university. And at our university, we also, we went from having, um, you know, identifying modalities in terms of face-to-face -face versus online versus hybrid. I can't even remember, but now we have like a big long list of like all of these different types of modalities <laughs> that we parsed out. Um, and, and so, for example, now I'm, I am doing really what I'm not even sure what the technical term is that the university is using, but it's an asynchronous online hybrid with synchronous components modality um, that seems to be really effective. <laughs> and the students like it because it kind of gives them a lot of flexibility from the asynchronous components of the course where they still have the connection with their teammates and doing live case experiential learning with organizations. So they're kind of getting all of those components, but still a lot of the flexibility. Um, all of this though, I think is, is really preparing students for the future of work. And we know just like the acceleration into adoption of technologies has changed higher ed. It's also changed the workplace, generally speaking, uh, companies that were hesitant and didn't want to adopt these technologies were forced to do the same. And so our students have to, just like we've had to pivot quickly, our students have had to learn how to do that as well, because the reality is we're not going back. There's going to be some pendulum swing, but in the future, uh, we're going to continue to see increasingly distributed workforces with people working all over the world, being on cross-functional, cross-contextual uh, uh, teams, and students have to learn how to do that. They have to learn how to do that across time zones. They have to learn how to do that effectively when they never see the person in, per, you know, face to face, but they only have a Teams meeting or a or a Microsoft or a, a Zoom meeting or whatever technology you're using. Um, and so, in my OD and change management course, I tell the students, you know, this is actually kind of a multi pronged live case course. It's it, you know, you're doing the experiential learning project for a live organization, a consulting project, that's a live case kind of an environment. But they're also having to like figure out and wrestle with how do we effectively work together as a team. Um, that's a live case kind of an environment. And, and frankly, a lot of OD and change management and culture change and those types of topics that we cover in the course, you know, a lot of that comes back to how do you work effectively as a team. And so 
you know, I want to see them learning and applying the course concepts into how they do their teamwork so they can be more effective. And then the other piece is, you know, the, the shifting nature of work and the landscape of work and the distributed workforce and, and the contingent workforce and the gig economy, and like all these different components that are leading into how the future of work is changing. They have to be addressing it in real time in the class as they're doing their projects with each other and with their client organization. Um, so, you know, all of that, I try to parse that out and to point that out to the students because uh, they don't always make those connections unless I make it explicit. But, you know, th- this is the kind of an environment they're going to find themselves in in the future. So we want to make sure that they're ready for it. And I feel like I'm doing my part to help them with that. So I'm just starting doing my service learning this uh, semester, started this semester. So I'm still learning a lot. And John says that he's been doing it for probably 12 years. I'm just a beginner here. So I was reading some uh, literature and came up with some um, ideas on what I could do for service learning. So part of my class is synchronous because they have to get with their their partners and decide what they need to do that part. And then also I have discussion boards uh, and I'm teaching, like I said, business ethics. So it's more, it's going to be more of a soft skill or being more of a get more information from different people. Maureen mentioned that a lot of our students are working, they have families, they're very busy. So online works very well for them. I am, um, I think it's really useful for this, uh, especially for this one assignment, uh, getting a soft skill, trying to figure out under business ethics, finding out Uh, what their ethical dilemma has been in the last six months and what they did and go through an uh, an ethical analysis. And uh, all of the students, like I said, for this class, they're all in one team, is um, able to read all the others and what they did. So they can see all these different people working in different environments. I think this is very useful to see what they did and what their ethical dilemmas are so that they can step into the workplace and know, oh yeah, I heard about that. I heard about this. They have to make comments to their other colleagues as well. Um, So they're, I think in this area, especially in ethics, they will be more attuned to what they need to um, be um, maybe prepared for so that they know. So the tech part, they're learning on their own, and I'm helping them with their discussions and doing and using their LMS and putting it into modalities, etc., like Yang was talking about, but also the these deep thinking things where they have to think about what is happening, and how am I going to um, actually look at this dilemma and meet it head on because my colleagues have done it and now I know what's maybe going to happen and I can do the same. All right. Thank you. We are going to just have one final comment from each panelist and that is what are your biggest takeaways from COVID-19 as business school educators? And then we'll open it up and we would like to hear from you and get your ideas and any questions you have. When I went to Virginia Tech for my PhD course, my professor in the strategy management course, and he emphasized about the microporals, five force, as you know, the miles and snows, about how we're going to take a challenge, something like that. How we're gonna uh, dealing with the uh, some threat uh, can be changeable to the opportunity. So I we we when when the COVID situation came out maybe two years ago, I think there is nothing we can do. But uh, as the time goes by, we learned how we're gonna uh, change the threat to opportunity, and then how we can adjust ourselves into the uh, uh, better way to. Uh, dealing with the COVID situation. So uh, I learned that from the COVID that how we can, as a human being, and how it depends on how we're going to adjust ourselves into 
uh, different uh, angle. So I encourage my students, same thing. When, when you are dealing with a different subject, like a step class, and most, most students' pers- perspective was that, oh, it's so hard, and then I want to just pass the course. But I encourage them by using a COVID situation that you overcome right now, and then you can overcome the situation you have for this, my cor- the, the step course, same way. So I encourage them to overcome and then take a challenge as like a way of the, how you're going to uh, dealing with that. And then the uh, same thing will be happen in the, uh, your future career, something like that. So uh, I think that uh, having a COVID is a great way that how we can change our perception uh, by looking at a different angle. Yeah, the pandemic has definitely been a crash course um, in, in change and, in, in trying to pivot. And I think we've learned, uh, both through the pain and, and the trial, uh, uh, but also through the opportunity, you know, that this really is a chance for ongoing learning and development. And I think that's been a very positive outcome uh, of the pandemic, despite all of the, the hard things that have occurred. Um, I, I just published an article on change agility and change readiness, and that's, I would say that's my biggest takeaway from all of this in the last couple of years is the rate and pace of change um, is only accelerated uh, as we think two, five, 10 years into the future. And we try to uh, project out the future of work and what even our jobs as academics uh, in the higher ed will look like. There's no putting the genie back in the bottle. Like we're just continuing to, to move forward and we have to learn how to be ready to adopt, to adapt and to adopt the changes that are happening around us so that we're being proactive and strategic as we move forward and not just being reactionary. Uh, and, and it's all about change agility. So uh, moving forward, you know, I want my students to learn how to be agile and to be ready for change in their careers. Uh, I want faculty in the department to learn how to do the same. I hope that that's something I'm trying to do and modeling for people. Uh, ultimately, that's going to be the name of the game in the future, that we, we just have to be ready for a constant state of, of adapting and change uh, if we hope to stay relevant and, and add value um, to our students and to, to the broader community. I think to add to both of those I mean, we're talking about tech, uh, tech, and we're talking about um, the agility, but we can't forget that the people that we're dealing with are real people, and they have, um, they need the exceptional care, like we've talked about, and I've learned a lot about that, trying to give exceptional care to my students, what I need to do to help them even more. Sometimes I have to take a stand when they haven't done any of the work for the whole semester. I can't go backwards and say, yes, you can do it, but I can help a lot with a lot of different problems that students have come up with. With this agility is also a lot of brokenness that comes. So, and I've seen that, and I think we need to keep that in mind as well to be exceptionally care and careful. Thank you very much, panelists, for your insights and uh, sharing your experiences. Thank you very much. Time is up. So appreciate your attendance and aloha. Aloha. Thanks, everybody. Bluer than indigo leadership the journey of becoming a truly remarkable leader. Early in my adult life, I learned about an Asian proverb that translates as bluer than indigo. If you think about the color indigo, it is a brilliant, deep, and vibrant blue, what some would call the bluest of blues. To have something that is bluer than indigo is rare and truly remarkable. Contrary to popular myth, there is no one-size-fits-all or cookie-cutter approach to effective leadership. There is no silver bullet, no secret sauce, no go-to model that will solve all of your problems. The truth is, great leaders have all had their unique strengths and flaws, and have all had to discover and then pave their own distinctive path in their life's journey to fulfill their leadership potential. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership will help you discover your own path and explore those ordinary, everyday actions that will help you respond to an uncertain future and produce extraordinary results for your individuals, teams, and organizations.
check out Human Capital Innovations magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free interactive e-magazine with the mission to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We publish issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Take a look at the latest issue and let us know what you think. The Alchemy of Truly Remarkable Leadership. Ordinary, everyday actions that produce extraordinary results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years. With increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition, the average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations podcast? Please subscribe, leave a review, comment, share, and consider supporting the podcast on Patreon even at the producer and sponsorship levels. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.